The Exorcist, Jaws, The Shining, The Thing, The Evil Dead, these are all great horror films that everybody's seen. But what are the best horror films that you've never seen? Let's get into this episode where we break them down. What's up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. And today we put together a good list of horror films that we think most of you have not seen. Now, these are a bunch of classics, a bunch of oldies from all over the world, from France, from Italy, from Japan. We got some great silent film here, silent films here, as well as just some really crazy slashers. Now, the genre of horror is massive. There are so many big famous ones, but I think that anybody who's interested in the horror genre and wants to watch some more, maybe dive deeper into the lesser known, you know, the B tracks of the horror genre. But they're not B tracks. They're just they're unknown. Not, yeah, yeah. These are they're not B horror movies. Some these, of them are. Yeah, yeah. Some of them are. <laughs> these are some really good ones, and some of them are, in my opinion, a couple some of the best films ever made in the horror genre. But I really hope you guys enjoy this list and even check out a bunch of these movies if you have not yet seen them. Let's start with a Brian De Palma film. Of course, from 1980, he made Dress to Kill, starring. The great Michael Caine, Nancy Allen, and Keith Gordon is about this woman named Liz Blake, who's a sex worker, prostitute, who sees a mysterious woman brutally slay homemaker Kate Miller. She finds herself trapped in a dangerous situation. While the police think Liz is the murderer, the real killer wants to silence the crime's only witness. Only Kate's investor's son, Peter, believes Liz. Peter and Liz team up to find the real culprit who has an unexpected means of hiding her identity and even more surprising motivation to kill. 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 This is a pretty good, good synopsis, yeah, I guess, a great overall. Synopsis. Yeah, it's a solid synopsis. Although they didn't mention uh, Michael Caine's character in the synopsis. Michael Caine plays a, a psychiatrist, ther- a psychiatrist yeah. with uh, he's, it's a great role for Michael Caine. And this is one of Brian De Palma's best films. It's definitely up there in his top three. Visually stunning, great score. It's very sexy. Yeah. It's very intimate. It, I mean, it opens with a really intimate shower scene. <laughs> it's James, hot. James got his boobs. Don't worry. It's hot, he man. His boobs. I got my boobs. That's real, why he loves this real one. Real quick, real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great twist. A couple twists to this movie. Yes. The last twist is just so shocking and jarring. It'll leave your jaw on the floor. I didn't really see it coming, I would say. I was sort of suspecting it, kind of. But they do a great job with the writing and, and filmmaking to sway suspicion towards sort of the obvious culprit who you might think it would be. And it's incredibly stylish. It's so stylish. Dude, the it's, filmmaking is so cool. The, stylish, the stylishness of this film... It's beyond styling. It created the yeah. word style. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not the first Brian De Palma film we'll see on this list because he made a ton of great horror films. But next up, we're keeping it in the slasher genre with an Italian film from the Italian horror master Dario Argento, Deep Red, which is I, what I think is his best film... Um, it's about it's a slasher film, just like Dress to Kill, but in this case, uh, re- a musician who's working in Italy witnesses a murder of a woman. Uh, he sees her stabbed out a window, and <gasps> it's a crazy scene. It's <gasps> unbelievable. And then he spends the rest of the story trying to basically solve the murder. He like takes it upon himself. He's like, I'm gonna figure out what happened. I need to know who did this to this woman. And he takes on a sidekick, and together they're searching. Um, throughout the, the various areas of Italy, and it's so good. The kills are fantastic, and it's this really tonal balance. It's so hard to do where he balances cheesy cringiness with like great drama and fun kills, and it's just like it's tightrope walk that Argento manages to pull off perfectly. It's a very unique kind of film, and I I adore Deep Red. If you like slashers. Deep Red and Dress to Kill, put them on your list. Absolutely. Now, if you like surrealism and weird, trippy shit, <laughs> Mandy is a movie for you. Not St- Molly. No, Mandy. <laughs> Who said Molly? Oh, Molly. <laughs> the drug. Mandy. You can watch it while on Molly. I mean, you feel like you're on Molly in certain scenes in Mandy. Starring Nicolas Cage, directed by Italian filmmaker Panos Cosmatos. This came out just in 2018. And I feel like this is a horror movie where people see... A specific image of Nicolas Cage on the inter- internet a lot. It's him in a car covered in blood wearing like a bulletproof vest and just like smiling crazily. This is that movie. It's very colorful, very vibrant. We got lots of reds, pinks, greens, blues. It's very neon lit in incredible ways. And it's it's sort of a drug film 
and psychedelic horror movie. I, I would call it a psychedelic horror movie. Yeah, definitely. Big time. Now, in the, it, here's a plot synopsis of Mandy, which you got to watch. In the Pacific Northwest in 1983, outsiders Red Miller and Mandy Bloom lead a loving and peaceful existence <laughs> when their prime-scented haven is savagely destroyed by a cult led by the sadistic Jeremiah Sand. Red is catapulted into a phantasmagoric journey filled with bloody vengeance and laced with deadly fire. It's a great revenge flick. And also another another common thing that people see on the internet, like a video meme, is Nicolas Cage in a bathroom with just tidy whities on wearing a shirt that has a tiger on it, freaking out. Ah! That, that's this movie. That's this movie. With like a bottle of scotch in his hand or something like that. So he his wife gets murdered. Yes. He's out for revenge on this crazy sadistic cult that committed the murder against her in a horrific way. It's really cool. It's very original. It blends together like fantasy monsters and there's crazy fight sequences. It's like you never seen anything like it before. It's it gets it, it's a movie where as it continues to unfold, it gets crazier with every scene. And that it's such a fun watch. It's it's a really weird fucking movie, but it's super cool. You know what it is, Anthony? Uh, stylish stylish it's phantasmagoric 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 it's not that hard of a word <laughs> it, is that, it is that hard of a word phantasmagoric phantasmagoric it's an easy one that's rolls not an easy it rolls one. off the tongue it's, it's a, yeah it's said in common common dialogue phantasmagoric all the time. boom phantasmagoric phantasmagoric only five syllables nice you got it i'll teach you sometime <laughs> you should get a shirt that says phantasmagoric i kind of like that it's a yeah. great word it's a good word i'm gonna start using Gargantuan. that word i always wanted to use that word chlamydia <laughs> Do you have I think it? My, I think I might name my daughter Chlamydia. <laughs> What's that from? It's from Waiting. <laughs> Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds movie where, <laughs> so right before a waitress comes up to a table, there's just two guys talking. One of them's like, Chlamydia is a beautiful word. I think I might name my daughter Chlamydia. <laughs> 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 it is. A, it, when you take out the context, it's a nice word. Chlamydia. Chlamydia. It's a lovely, it sounds like Greek, like a Greek god. It would god. be like a lovely name. It sounds like a Greek god. <laughs> it's obviously an STD. <laughs> you don't want to uh, be associated with chlamydia. No. All right. Timothy I... Chalamet. Just kidding. <laughs> Does he have it? No, no. The rumor's like, uh, where do you go to school? NYU. I guess the rumor's he, he spread STDs everywhere. You never, you never heard this? <laughs> no. Because he, he, he banged every girl there. <laughs> but chlamydia, chlamydia's everywhere, man. <laughs> If you haven't had chlamydia, you just haven't lived. Just take a penicillin shot. Everyone's had it. <laughs> just kidding, not everyone's had it. But yeah, that's that's the rumor. You just spread it around NYU or something like that. What a G. Don't don't quote me completely, but oh I've God, read Timmy. stories. To me. All right, next up. He's just he's just laying it down all over that school. <laughs> <laughs> Poor NYU girls. All right, next up we have. I'm sure they had a good time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a French horror film. From 1962. It was originally released in 1960 in France and then to 62 in the USA. This is Eyes Without a Face. That's just a scary image. Yeah, which is an unbelievable, incredible horror film. It's about this this girl who's suffered a horrible injury of having her face basically ripped off and disfigured. And her father is a surgeon. And he's been on this quest to replace her face with someone else's. So he has enlisted the help of his secretary, who he helped give a face, face trans, kind of a face transfusion, so she like owes him big time, um, and they have been setting out killing, a kidnapping woman who look like similar to his daughter, taking off their faces like face off. So basically, what you're saying is they made face off in 1962. They made face off in 1962 without a face. And believe it or not, Nick Cage and Josh Volter are actually in this movie. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> They were babies. <laughs> uh, and so that's the setup for the story. And the whole mil the whole film is uh, the daughter trying to come to terms with like the fact that like she has no – she's struggling with her identity without having a face. And then coming to the terms with the fact that like her, her dad like kills people. And also suspicious cops trying to figure out what's going on as well as – the fiance of the one of the new girls that they've kidnapped for her face is like, where's my girlfriend? And he starts hunt, looking for her. And so all these things coincide. And it's really thrilling, gripping, incredible body horror. Really, for the time, groundbreaking prosthetic work. Uh, it, there's a surgery scene. And I was like, I can't believe they did that in 1962. It looks great. It looks really fantastic. I couldn't recommend it enough. Um, you can watch this 
on Max. Eyes without a face. Are we doing streaming locations? I, I didn't realize we were doing this. I'm, I'm prepared for this, Anthony. Let's do it. I told you I'm unprepared for this. Oh, I thought you said you're prepared for it. I'm unprepared for this. That um, that un was like... It was there. It was, it was a subtle un. I barely There's heard no it. There's no such thing as a subtle un. It's, it literally sounded like... Because I'm prepared for this. No, it said... No, I literally held that and I said, I'm unprepared for this. No, nope. There are four ends in I that. I didn't even hear an end. We need to replay the tape. You said, I, I'm prepared for this. I'm prepared to beat your ass. That's what he said. That's exactly what it sounded like. <laughs> That's exactly what it sounded like. <laughs> Maybe it's because I was getting a blueberry seed out of my tooth at the same time when I said it. <laughs> so like, they get in the there. Un- they yeah, get there's, in one, there. there's one in there. I'm trying to work it out at the same time as saying the word unprepared didn't work. So, so maybe, maybe I'm, un- <laughs> yeah, see, I'm prepared. That's it. That's it. That might have been the cause of the confusion. But let's get into another fantastic horror film from the great Alfred Hitchcock. Back in 1972, he made a film called Frenzy, which is just a classic serial killer mo- movie. The killer of cho- weapon of choice in this film is a necktie. And fun fact, he tried to get Al- um, Michael Caine, speak of the devil, Michael who Kine. was just in Dressed to Kill in our episode, to be the lead role of this movie. Oh. And Michael Caine turned him down saying, I don't want to play a sadistic serial killer. Meanwhile, in Spoilers. other films, he's never done that before. Never, never done it before. Never done that before in a role ever. But he turned You're down. You're supposed to blow the bloody doors off. <laughs> 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 no, that's not a Michael Caine. That's Michael Caine. He's got older. He's got much slower. And he does. Lower and lower. And lower. That's this in motion of Michael Caine. He gets really down here. I won't bury another Batman. <laughs> no, that's a Michael Caine. <laughs> uh, but friends, he's a classic from Alfred Hitchcock that hides in the shadows of many of his other great films. Like many of his other great films. He's got like five movies that everyone knows about and talks about. Then he's got like... 20 that no one's ever seen, I would say. For, Nobody's for modern, ever seen no, any for of modern, them. For today's audience, it's like, oh, I've never even heard of Frenzy. I've yeah. never heard of Rope. Yeah. And I think Frenzy's one to put on your list if you like horror movies, if you like serial killer movies. A couple great twists in this film. And really graphic? You don't really see yeah. the twists coming, like in many great horror films, I, I would say. It's, I was shocked the first time I saw it. It's very graphic how he filmed it, and he was, he was really pushing the envelope because he, he battled with censorship all his career. And this is the 70s where they, they were lightening up, and so... His filmmaking is it, it got it was very energetic in this film, and he was really like having fun. It looked like with how he was shooting everything. Uh, this is none of his other films looked like this. It's it's really cool. It's an interesting film to see on his filmography, um, but definitely check out Frenzy. It's a fantastic movie. I love it. It's good stuff. All right, next up we have Black Sunday, which is a really fantastic black and white Italian film. About a witch who vows revenge. So this this woman, she's like a princess who practices witchcraft. Uh, she's killed for being a witch, but she vows revenge. I'm gonna kill my my tormentors. And so like a couple hundred years later, she's re- re- she resurrects from um, the death from dead from being dead from death from, from being dying. Dead. And then she inhabits the body of a, a young girl uh, who looks like just like her. And then she uh, raises an arm, like an, a small posse, like of henchmen, and vows to kill all the people who were like the kin of the people who cur- killed her originally. This is a beautiful film. It's one of the best looking films on the list. Black and white photography, gothic. It's got that like gothic, stunning vibe, incredible shadow work, great sets, and great production design. Um, really cool prosthetics, especially with her face. Um, there's some messed up stuff going on in her face a couple of times, but really interesting film. Anyone who's fans of witchcraft or, or witch movies, add this to your watch list. Black Sunday came out in 1961, uh, directed by Mario Brava. Well, speaking, Brava. speaking of great set pieces and production design and filmmaking, sure. and another movie I'm sure you've seen images of, posters of on social media, talking about horror films specifically, Kwaidon, which came out in 1964 from director Masaki Kobayashi, this Japanese horror film, which is an anthology ghost story, has some of the most incredible practical filmmaking you'll see in a horror film. I guess you could say it's as surreal and interesting and phantasmagoric as (laughs) 
Mandy is, more is. But in it's more not so, a contemporary yeah. sense, but in a 1960s practical sense, because the filmmaking is really astounding. It's a movie that reminds me of, of House in terms of the weird practical things that they were doing. The lighting's really interesting. You know, you'll have an entire scene where lighting is, everything's blue, but then there's just one specific part of the scene that's lit orange or yellow or white. So they, they did really interesting things with production design, with lighting, with set design. And it's really stellar film. And if you like ghost stories, anthologies, and samurai, it's up there. And Kobayashi made um, Harakiri, one of the greatest directors of all time. And this is a, it's an anthology. It's four, basically four short films, not related at all, but um, they're all um, famous stories uh, that he adapted into this whole anthology. And every story has a completely different look and color palette. Uh, really cool. There's there's one there's a shot in this movie in this in the first one with hair. And I was like, I'd never been scared of hair before, but if you watch the film, you know what I mean. And then there's a beautiful, uh, like, snowy ghost one that's really stunning. And there's, like, there's a cool naval ship battle in another one where they shot it on sound stages, but you don't even care. Um, and it's about, like, the interactions of the ghosts of a naval battle. Um, it's just so cool. There's nothing like it. And uh, Marta McFly from TikTok, she's been on our show before. She actually recommended this film to me last year, and I watched it, and I was like, unbelievable. Five out of five. It's incredible. It's insane production and makeup stuff. It's it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. It is it is Phantom or oh, I can't say it. Phantasmagoric. Phantasmagoric. What is that? It's Phantasmagoric. <laughs> Phantasmagoric. It's Phantasmic. Phantasmagoric. It's Phantasmagoric. Watch Quiet It. It's Phantasmagoric. <laughs> you can watch Quiet It on Max, too. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Fantasmag- <laughs> oh, no. Think of Evan. Fantasmagoric. All right, next up we have our first Guillermo del Toro film. He's going to have a couple on this list, but his first one is Kronos, which came out in 1994. It's a movie that really helped put him on the map. Rob Perlman's in this too. This is the first collaboration. Yes, best bud. So this is uh, Guillermo del Toro's take on vampires in a way. So the way that he... Um, it's not exactly vampires, but it's like a, his spin on it. And he, it's really cool lore where there's this old golden scarab beetle artifact. And what it does is it, it takes blood from a person. And when it bites your hand, it, it injects you with like this whatever it, substance that gives you prolonged life. But also gives you vampiric qualities, strengths, and weaknesses. And so it's... Uh, what happens is this dealer finds it and starts learning what it is, um, but then he doesn't want to get rid of it. But he's like suffering the consequences of turning into a monster, essentially. It's so cool. It's shocking. Ron Perlman's hilarious in it. Um, but it's a really fantastic film, visually stunning. Great, great, incredible gore stuff. Like uh, Guillermo, I love when he goes full horror because it's so much fun. It's really graphic, very bloody. Um, it's just really an ingenious concept and a twist on a genre and a lore that we all know so well. And I think he had a lot of fun with it. Good pick. Yeah. Good pick. Let's get into a French film. Yes. From 1955. From director Henry Georges Clazou. Le Diabolique. Le Diabolique. I think that's how you say it in French. Le Diabolique. Le, le, le Diabolique. Diabolique. No, I think Diabolique. I think it's Diabolique. Yeah. And then it's in English, which just said Diabolique. Yeah. So, this film, <laughs> as we get past grammar. Or like the Diabolicals. Yeah, no, but, but I think it's just Diabolique. Yeah. This film is about a headmaster, a cruel, uh, abusive headmaster, who's married to this woman and also has a mistress, who has a murder plot against him. And they carry it out in a horrific way. It's it's a great sequence of really pioneering horror cinema, the way they film the death and the murder. And they carry this. This isn't a uh, spoiler. It's in the summary. It's the setup. It's the setup. Yeah. It's, a, it's the trailer. It's the freaking it's the poster. the first 20 yeah. minutes. Yeah. And then, however, these women, after they've been brought together by this man, their hatred for this man, they carry out his murder, the body disappears. Yeah. And now they're just basically trying to figure out where what happened to the body and all these other odd occurrences start to happen. Yeah. And... So what happens is they cut, they they hate him because he like basically uses them both, and so they're like, let's fucking kill him, let's kill this guy, and they do. But then the body disappears, like you said, and they're like, what happened? And so it's a mystery of trying to figure out what exactly happened. 
but also a couple of odd occurrences are happening around the boarding school as well. And I'm telling you, one of the best twists of all time. This movie, one of the best ever. It's incredible. It also, it's just got, it has one of the most disturbing death scenes. It's how they kill him. It's like, I I can't believe it's, it's this old because it like shook me to my core when I watched it happen. Because of how they filmed it and just how, how, how well it was acted in. It was just like one of those moments where I was like, holy shit, that, I've never seen that in a movie before. It was that intense. Definitely check out Le, Le Diabolique also on Max. A lot of these movies are on Max. Max has a great library of old movies. If you search for them, yeah. yeah just they don't advertise drop. anything good on their homepage. Yeah, you just gotta, you have to, the way to find them, the only way to find them is to go into the drama category and then scroll down alphabetically. It's the only way yeah, to find horror, movies. The yeah. horror category, too. Oh, yeah, horror category, yeah, obviously. I don't know why I didn't say that. I don't know why you didn't say it either. It's like, you might as well have said <laughs> comedy. <laughs> All right, next up. Do they we, have a phantasmagoric section? They better after this. They, here's another movie you can find on Max, Haxon, uh, which is a really great silent film. It's about witchcraft, and so uh, it's an anthology as well, a bunch of short vignettes about uh, the stories of witchcraft, uh, rituals of witchcraft, um, and all sorts of things regarding that world. Um, really cool prosthetic work, very cheesy, but also very funny at the same time. Um, it's, it's pretty wild. There's really nothing like it. Um, it's a fun watch. It's pretty quick. I think it's less than an hour long. Um, but definitely check out, uh, Haxon. Uh, I, and I like it. It's not all black and white. They, they colorize a lot of the film. So some of it's red. Some of it's got like a blue tint to it. Um, it visually striking, but like really like skin crawling weird. Sometimes it's really disturbing. Yeah. That was a common thing. A lot of Silent film was doing. They they would tint the film. Yeah, pinks, yellows, blues. That was usually the common colors. A lot of Japanese silent film did that. Very cool. Very very cool. Let's get into the Night of the Hunter, which we actually just talked about on was it movie news? Yeah, literally because yeah. a remake is being made of this movie, which is based on a book of the same night same name. And in the movie, in the book, it's really excellent. It's about this this uh, preach this preacher who's a serial killer and. Just a terrible guy, a criminal. <laughs> he's a bad dude. He's a criminal. I mean, he gets yeah. arrested for a stolen car, yeah. and he's a serial killer. And then he eventually meets this woman and wants to marry her because he wants to find this $10,000 in loot that she had that her he husband her, stole. that he stole and buried somewhere. Yeah, so, so the movie opens with her husband evading cops, and they chase him down. He had just stolen money, and he right before the cops took him in, he gave the, he gave the money to his son and is like, hide it. And don't tell anyone where it is. That's and, set up. And then he's just trying to woo the family, woos the mom. But the kids know he's up to no good. He's up to a different plot. He's got ulterior motives here yes. for why he entered the family. And now this actually has a connection to Spike Lee. So in Spike Lee, the, um, what do you call the knuckle guard things? Bronze knuckles. Yeah. Uh, you know how they says love and hate? Yeah. He actually pulled it from this movie because Robert Mitchum's character, the preacher, has love and hate tattooed on his fingers. And this is actually one of Spike Lee's favorite movies. He shows it to all of his NYU classes. Um, but he lifted the tattoos and made them brass knuckles in... Um, um, why? Oh my God, what's his move? Uh, Do the Right Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Esposito yeah. and the other guy. Was yeah. yeah, right? Yeah. So that's where he got it from, love and hate. Did you see he just recently put out his 100 movies... Great, 100 greatest movies of all time list. Really? Yeah, it's a really, it. really good list. Oh, I want to see that. Maybe we should do an episode breaking it down. Spike Lee's top 100? Fuck yeah. Yeah, and, and Marty made like a top 20, I think, as well. Well, what happens is last year Marty made a top like 16 because someone asked him what, what his, some magazine asked what his top 10 was and he put like 16 up. <laughs> he's like, I can't choose 10. Spike, let me read his, his top though. He's, let's, he's hear, got, let's hear his top few. His top few, is this in order? Here we I'm go. Curious. Yeah, he just dropped it. Uh, Bad Lieutenant, Rushamon, oh, shit. Jumbo, Ran, Rear Window, Vertigo, North by Northwest, Bonnie and Clyde, The Conformist, Last Tango in Paris, Ace in the Hole, Some Like It Hot, Killer of Sheep, Night of the Hunter, like number 15, Wow. Raising Arizona, The Bridge of the River, Kwai, Lawrence of Arabia, On the Waterfront, A Face in the Crowd, La Strada, La Dolce Vita, Eight and a Half, City of Gods, The Godfather, The Godfather Part 2, 400 Blows. He just sounds like a classic film boy. What a fucking gr- film boy. Oh, wait, what a film boy. And he also just has District 9 on here. Out of that's nowhere. great. Uh, I love to see I that. I like how he has uh, Last Tango in Paris. That's that's a good one. He's a po- of, of movies made after the century, he only has 
City of Gods. He City had, of God? He wrote Gods. Oh, he wrote Gods? Yeah. Hold on. The list says City of Gods. And then post-2000, he also has on here, like I said, District 9. And then Kung Fu Hustle. <laughs> Dirty Pretty Things. <laughs> and Apocalypto. Oh, fuck yeah. Oh, I feel like I would get along really well with Spike. <laughs> we got to have him on the show. Yeah, it's he's got a great list. He's a, he's such a film guy. Like, everything before the 1970s, he's, Yeah, really. he's a cinephile. See what's, see what's so sad is a lot of people online will call him pretentious for that list. Probably, but these are just some of the best movies ever. For, Mar- for Marty, he has Mean Streets and Raging Bull. Fuck yeah. Marty was he? Marty helped him make his so first movie. So these are his ninety-five favorite movies. That's what it is. Cool. His favorite movies. Not I gotta check greatest. out that list. His favorite. Mm-hmm. He's got Chinatown on there too. Nice. Oh, yeah. Smart guy. Wicked smart. All right, next. Let's move on to our next film, which is actually, believe it or not, an Audrey Hepburn star. This is Wait Until Dark, which came out in nineteen sixty-seven, directed by Terrence Young, who actually made a bunch of James Bond movies. So after a flight back home. Sam returns with a doll he innocently required along the way during his trip. His wife, played by uh, Audrey Hepburn and Susie, he brings the doll home, but then he's going to bounce. Um, unbeknownst to Sam, though, the drug is filled with drugs. And the people who are in charge of transporting it want it back. On top of that, Susie, played by Audrey Hepburn, is blind. And so we have... Basically, the this is the OG home invasion film. So Susie, so Audrey's blind in this film. She doesn't even know where the doll is, and these criminals are trying to get her to tell her where the doll is. So they actually all con her, and two of the two of the criminals end up playing like multiple roles of people visiting her and trying to infiltrate the home. And it's about it's a matter of whether or not she can understand what's going on and catch the hints that something's afoot. And it leads to a really fantastic third act. Incredible use of light with a dark setting. Um, and Audrey Hepburn, one of my favorite performances of her, playing against type. Um, and she's just phenomenal. And also, I gotta say, Alan Arkin plays the villain of this movie. And he's always been like a really fatherly kind of guy, especially the last 20 years. He is incredible. He's amazing as a villain in this movie. I couldn't recommend it enough. Check out Wait Until Dark. Now, let's get into an Australian horror film that came out in 2005. I remember this directed one. Directed by Greg McLean, who they made a little franchise out of this. I think they made three of them, Wolf Creek, Wolf Creek three movies. It's somewhat based on true stories. That not was just, how they build it. Yeah, not, yeah. not one true story, but it's they, it was built as based on a true story, but it's really yeah. like several crime stories put together and then obviously sensationalized for a movie. And it's about these road trippers in remote Australia they're plunged into danger when they're kind of out of their limits. They're trying to hike through the scenic Wolf Creek National Park in the Australian Outback, but then their car won't start. They're kind of stranded, but then they run into a local bushman named Mick Taylor, and things start to go wrong because then it hits that trope of the classic don't trust the stranger in the middle of nowhere yeah. uh, cliche, uh, which obviously sometimes is a fake trap in horror movies. But sometimes it's just still there. But you see the inspiration of this or that kind of character in horror movies all over the place. Even sure. something like Cabin in the Woods, the classic local who you don't want to trust that's in the, in the small town. Don't go down that road. Don't go down that road. Down there. Fucking um, <laughs> <laughs> South Park. <laughs> but um, this, is, this isn't maybe critically the best movie on this list, obviously. It's sort of hit or miss for audiences and critics alike. Yeah. But it's still really good. I really enjoyed it. I remember as a kid, we watched it and loved it. We, we watched it a few times. We watched it all the time when we were kids. Yeah, <laughs> we did not watch this all the time. We wow. watched it a few times. Wow. We watched it a few times. But it's a cool concept, and it worked because I remember thinking it was based to come, like this really happened. You know, they the based on a true story horror movies were were hot back then. There was a period where like that was really in for horror. Like, oh, true events. Plus, I mean, Crocodile Dundee was still pretty hot in the 90s, early 2000s, so it kind of tapped into the Australian aesthetic and vibe and the big knife kind of thing. Yeah, vibe. Like the Bushman with a big... That's not a knife. This is a this knife. Is a knife. He's got a massive knife in this, too. Yeah, 100%. I've never seen the other ones, though. I I doubt they're very good. <laughs> All right, next up, we have a Persian film, A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. This came all, all the way back in 2014 and is a really cool black-and-white horror film. 
So this is this follows the story of a young skateboarding vampire who preys on men who disrespect women. So this girl, she kind of like roams around the city, um, making it seem like she is like primed to be a victim. Um, and she's kind of like in a way a vigilante-esque vampire. However, she does fall in love with a, a boy her age, which complicates things. This is really cool. Uh, really, really well photographed. Um, really fantastic film. It might have been the first Persian film I ever saw. Um, and then Anna Lily uh, Amir Poor has made a couple of movies since then. Uh, the Bad Batch with Jason Momoa and Tucky Waterhouse. But this is her best film by far. Um, it's really fantastic and a really cool vampire movie. Speaking of vampire movies, we have Vampire, which came out in 1932. Out of Berlin, however, it was made by Danish filmmaker Carl, yeah, yeah. Carl Dreyer. He also did um, The Passion of Joan of Arc. Yeah, so this one, it's not exactly a silent film. It's got a lot of uh, elements of silent films with title cards for dialogue and sequences. However, there is some dialogue in here. He wanted to make it as his first talkie, first sound picture. However, it was a little difficult at the time, and they had to do it in multiple languages. So there is some spoken dialogue in there a little bit and some audio. However, it still operates many, mostly as a silent it's film. Mostly title cards, yeah. yeah. Mostly title cards. It's a really visually beautiful film, and he creates this remarkable use of shadow work. That uh, rem- it's very Bram Stoker's Dracula from Francis Ford Coppola. I think really pulled from this a lot uh, because uh, a lot of it's like these like beings that uh, they're they're shadows on walls in the playing of light, and um, it's really unbelievable photography. Um, great cinematography. I mean, I just, I the film is really striking. And for being m- a mostly silent film, it keeps you pretty much on the edge of your seat the entire time. There's some really cool images in this film. Yeah, it's really incredible. It was also critically not received at all when it got released, hmm. but has since obviously over the century of the, 20, the tw- 20th century and 21st century, it's become a classic. It's got some, like there's this, uh, the villain with like the scythe, yeah, the, the big scythe. Yeah, yeah, it's so cool. And he's like on a boat. It's just like, what the fuck? This is crazy. Like, that's like really like groundbreaking for horror for its day. All right, next up, we have one of the more recent films on this list. A film from Lars von Trier, the controversial filmmaker. We have The House That Jack Built, uh, starring Matt Dillon as a serial killer. Um, this is told in like uh, five acts, like five kind of bits as an anthology basically of him jack's recounting his uh, murders um he kills a person each time and it's like basically he's like building like this big towering work of art of bodies um it's really fucking crazy i've never seen anything like it before for serial killer movies it's it really i think breathed new life into the genre and gave us something new because it basically follows his perspective um most of the time and we're seeing it the the story through the serial killer's eyes, which I found really interesting. But also, it's just got that weird tone that Lars Van Trier movies always have, and then just really brutal gore and just fucked up things. Because if you watch a Lars Van Trier movie, you're gonna see you're gonna see stuff that disturbs you. That's just part of his brand, and this is right up there. And it also it it leads into a third act of it's like a descent into Dante's Inferno kind of third act, and it's like completely unexpected. And mind blowing, and it's just a remarkable horror film. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And like Matt Dillon, like I he, I thought his career was done, and then he made this. No, it's an awesome movie. And what's really interesting about it is it's sort of, as a serial killer, he for his whole life he's thought he's been obviously a tumor in the world. He's accepted that you could say, but then he realizes that maybe this is fate. This is what I'm supposed to be doing in a fucked up way. Things yeah. happen where it's like. Am I supposed to be doing this? Is this what I'm meant oh, to be yeah, doing? Oh, yeah, because, like, kill start. they kind of, like, just bring themselves to him. They bring themselves to him, yeah. but then the way he gets away with murder, sometimes it's just these crazy chance things happen yes. that help him get away with murders. He's like, is there <laughs> is God on my side? Yeah. It's really interesting. It's really it's a really cool movie. I forgot about that part of it. It's there, man. Let's get into a twin movie. Twinning! Sisters, directed by Brian De Palma in 1972. De Palma, now, baby! <laughs> this is about... Conjoined twins that were separated at birth, and one of them is suspected of committing a brutal murder witnessed by a neighbor. However, when the neighbor tries to get the police involved, her and the detective find nothing amiss. The detective doesn't think anything's going on, 
But now the woman by herself, the neighbor, wants to try to take matters into her own hand to try to figure out what's going on. But it's a great twin horror mystery. And it's basically about Anthony and I's life. <laughs> and also, uh, De Palma, he was, he's always, he was always the best um, prolific user of split screens. And I would say this has more split screen use than any of his other films, which is really saying something. And uh, split diopter shots. But so much split, split screen. And it really works well for the idea of twins. Um, but what's really cool is one twin is like feral and crazy. And the other one is just like normal. So it is like me and you. You're the feral one. It's fucked up. <laughs> How can I'm you just, say that? I'm just, I'm just saying that's what this film's about. Do I look feral to you? <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. Here, A put little... on this bandit mask. <laughs> fantastic Mr. Fox. Sick, sick reference, right? Yeah, uh, it took me. I was like, that's from something. Both, I, were, yeah. both were fantastic Mr. Fox references. Yeah, good stuff. You cousin with me? You cousin with me? I'm cousin with I'll you. I'm cousin with you. Come on, Christopher, sir. Christopherson. Christopher. Christopherson. Christopherson. Sorry. <laughs> Christopherson. I thought it was your favorite movie, man. I never said it in my life that's my favorite you movie. You said Fantastic Mr. Fox is my favorite movie. I know every line by heart. That's nice. <laughs> Just putting words in my mouth. All right. Next up, <laughs> let's move into one more film from France before we go into our intermission and finish up the rest of the second half of the list. Okay. Because we still got a lot more to do. Okay. Now, this movie fucked me up, man. This is Repulsion which came out in France in 1965. It's about a beautiful young woman who's a manicurist named Carol who suffers from androphobia. Uh, so she's, she's afraid of interacting with men. So whenever there are men around, she avoids them. If a man tries to approach her, even if it's innocent, she runs away. Um, and she lives with her sister who has a, a boyfriend, and she like can't even bear being around him. She's just very difficult to have in your life. And she's driving her sister crazy. And then after a series of, like, bad in incidents, um, she accidentally kills a man and then tries to cover it up and falls into deep, bewildering, insane madness. And the film becomes a surrealist horror fantasy that is absolutely incredible and bonkers. It's a brilliant film. It's one of the most interesting-looking horror films of all time. Um, it's just repulsion unbelievable movie it came out in 1965 and yet it was just like breaking through barriers of filmmaking and trying new things there's a great scene like if you google this film you'll see the images of it um the scene of her walking through a hallway of hands trying to grab her there's so much cool stuff in this and you've never seen anything like it before it's absolutely phenomenal phenomenal phenomenal, phenomenal. it's fantagasmic Phantasmagoric. Phantasmagoric. How can you not say this word? It just doesn't work with my brain. Phantasmagoric. 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 See, it just rolls off the tongue. Not for me. On its own. I won't be. I'm going to try it again later. We'll see. Well, anyways, let's move on to our intermission. But before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast, obviously you all noticed to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Why would you want to support this? Support us there is... Because you get so many perks, you would have yeah. been able to listen to this episode without ads, ad-free. Every episode goes to Patreon for you to listen to there, as well as access to weekly bonus episodes of the show. Access to our Discord, where we have watch parties. We just watched Roadhouse last week with a bunch of the listeners on Discord there. You get other kinds of perks as you go up the ladder on our Patreon. It's the best way to support the show. We can't do it without your support there. So thank you so much to everyone who is a patron. You can also leave those five-star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We love to read the written reviews out on Apple Podcasts. I'm going to read one out in just a minute. And I'll get a tattoo at 5,000 Apple ratings as promised. Uh, and Anthony's going to pick it out. Hopefully it's not too embarrassing. So <laughs> please leave those five-star reviews there. And also... Another great way to support the show is just to share us with your family and friends. Word of mouth is the best way for a podcast to grow. And if you want to help our show grow, share us with everyone you know. Share the load. Sound like a Dr. Seuss pitch. It does. I rhymed. Yeah. Well, this episode, of course, like always, is sponsored by our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com and get 10% off your order right now. Now, they have a huge selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library. Everything for the horror genre. So, for all you scary movie fans, if you want to get some horror posters, go to MoviePosters.com and use our promo code Raiders10 
at MoviePosters.com today. All right. You ready for the intermission? Ready. All right, movie quote competition. Here we go. Negative. I am a meat popsicle. <laughs> That's Brad Pitt. Wait, no. Wait, what the? F oh my God! It's negative. Are you human? Negative. I am a meat popsicle. Well, what's it from? Hold on. You're so close, man. You're you're right there. <laughs> you're there, man. On the radio, someone says, "Are you human?" This is negative. I am a meat popsicle. I'm gonna get really pissed. Is it sci-fi? Yeah. Okay. Negative. I am a meat pops. I don't know, man. I'm stumped. It's actually the fifth element. Oh. It's not on the radio. It's at Corbin Dallas's door. He's, yes. Yeah. He says, negative, negative. I'm, I'm a, a meat, 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 meat popsicle. popsicle. Yes. Are you human? That's it, man. Good one, man. You got me. You almost had it. I felt like you were pretty close, man. I, felt like you were pretty I just close. knew it was sci-fi. Otherwise, I was lost. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I was thinking Brad Pitt. All right, here's my quote. either, man. You're no Messiah. You're a movie of the week. You're a fucking t-shirt at best. <laughs> That's fucking great, man. <laughs> Seven. That's probably why I was thinking of Brad Pitt. Probably. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm often thinking about Brad Pitt. <laughs> In a Chalamet, apparently. What, with the, oh, that? With no. the chlamydia. Oh, that, that's, that's a funny story. It's a funny <laughs> anecdote that I've heard. It's kind of common knowledge on the internet. <laughs> I think it's I so hear funny. Things. I hear things, man. You're in with a now, man. I'm in. You're not. All right, what's your... Kid, kid cootie over there. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> this is like six times the last month James has told people I said kid cootie. Because you don't... You, <laughs> it's just a show that you're not hip. <laughs> We don't know anything about the world. <laughs> just because I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, that guy, that guy, Kid Cudi, right? He sounds like a fucking 80 year old. <laughs> just because I don't know who Kid Cudi is doesn't mean I'm not in with the world. <laughs> I know what's going on, man. I know what's going on. I still listen to rap. You don't have to listen to rap to know it's said Kid, Co Kid Cudi. Oh, uh, no, I keep how's it said? Oh, I keep making it fun of you because. <laughs> It's probably because I keep making fun of you too much, but sure. I haven't even said Cuddy out loud in a while. Sure. How about you name some Kid Cuddy songs? I don't know any Kid Cuddy songs. Oh, okay. I never said I did. <laughs> you just know who he is. I just know how to pronounce his name. <clears throat> but he's also friends with Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> <laughs> Segway. All right. Movie release here time. Let's do it. What year did Tremors come out? You mean the Dune ripoff? <laughs> <laughs> it's basically a Dune ripoff. <laughs> um, 1993. 1990. Oh, wow. Kevin Bacon. It's so, it's so Dune ripoff. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's pretty Dune-y. It's pretty Dune-y. What year did Seven come out? They made five movies out of Tremors. Seven came out in 1995. Correct. Wow, two for two. Come on, man. I know Seven pretty well. We'll see on the next one too. how well you know it. Oh, you got another seven oh, question? Yeah. <laughs> I, got, I have a good one that will stump you. I'm kind of scared we'll now. All right. Time for movie pop quiz. Who directed Gremlins? Joe Dante. Joe Dante is correct. Joe Dante. Okay, here's my seven question. It's a toughie. What is Gwyneth Paltrow's name in seven? That's a good fucking question. Um, let's see. It's not Gwen. It said a lot. It's not Gwen. It said quite a lot. Tracy. Yes. Good let's job. Go. Nice job. Three for three. That was a tough one. Here. Good one. Got it, man. I've seen that movie quite a bit, but I haven't seen it in a little while. I hopefully hope the next time I see it, it will be in IMAX. That'd be pretty epic. That'd be pretty. I'm holding out. I almost put it on the other night, but I'm like, I'm holding out. Yeah, I want to. I want to. I watched it last year. I watched it every year. Sometimes twice a year. You say that about a lot of movies. Have you seen my letterbox? Yeah. I have. Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any haters this week, Anthony? By the way, I went three for three. Just want to put that out there. Well done, man. Thanks. I, I tried to get you with Tracy. You tried to. You even said it was a toughie. It was tough. It was a great, it was a great answer, man. Thanks, man. Well, All right. We got some so unsubscribes. Nice. NPAL Biz wrote... On, uh, I went to the, the, the first Omen screening premiere. 
and Mpel Piz Biz wrote, "No invite unsubscribed." Sorry, pal. How was that movie? It was good. It was pretty good. It was. It was good. It looked great. It looked great. All right. Next up, Techno Staple wrote, <laughs> "It's a pulse rifle in Alien Romulus, not a plasma rifle." Yeah, I knew I was getting. I up. must unsubscribe from James for correcting. Quote, quotation mark, correcting his brother and still getting it wrong. Well, I did say, I think I said right after I said plasma rifle. I'm like, but I think it's something else. I, I believe that. I said that. I, don't, I think you said it's a plasma rifle. I knew it started with a P. You fucking idiot. And even when I said, I'm like, it's not shooting plasmas. I know that. So in a way, I was more right than you because I just called it a rifle. But you had to say, it's a plasma rifle. <laughs> 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 Whoa. It's a bit dramatic of an impression. <laughs> I think you're the one that sounds feral now. I sound just like you. Sound I thought like you. I thought I played a recording of you for a second. You wish. It's a plasma rifle. That's a fucked up. That's a messed up impression, Anthony. Well, we'll see if the fans think or not. Well, we'll see what the fans. <laughs> we'll see what the fans think or not. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you've been doing that voice of me for years. I do one funny impression of you once. One, one time, and it's like you take it. It's like I killed you. You're like, how dare you? Mine's actually you've been doing no, that. <laughs> you've been doing that voice to me for years. Here's, I never fought back on it. Here's the I never complained. Yes, you do. Here's the difference. Here's the difference. First of all, you do complain about it. Here it is. You complaining. Um, <laughs> exhibit A. No, I'm second complaining. of all, second of all, second of all, it's actually a good impression. <laughs> and it's funny. I got the voice crack. I got the heavy breathing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man it's good the kids love well, it well I'm gonna that's gonna be my voice for you from now on good good man <laughs> I can't wait to it. hear I can't wait to hear more about it <laughs> get used to it sister <laughs> first, of, first of many <laughs> I'm sorry sorry it meant to be like a friend punch sorry so- sorry <laughs> bye Evan <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> All right, next up, John Brasher wrote, The juice is loose! Shaking my head unsubscribed. What did I say? The juice. No, I said the juicy. juicy. No, no, you, you <laughs> I didn't just say, you said juicy. I said the juice is loose. No, I got there. No, yes, no. I did. Why would they comment that? Because we were trying to figure it out for a minute, but then I said the juice is loose, but I was like, I, th- I think it's the juice is loose. I think you said the juiciest juice. No, I guarantee I know I said the juice is loose. <laughs> I know I did. I'm working, it's movie. Why news, would right? John comment that though? Because we were trying to figure it out, and I. And so he's probably. It's just a funny thing to say. I think you got it wrong. It's the movie news last week, right? Yes. I'm gonna go back, and I know I was right. <laughs> I'll pull up the transcript right now. Pull up the transcript. Yeah. Get the transcript. I'm gonna pull it up. Let's hear it. We're gonna actually finally do this. We're actually we we have. We're debate. pulling the transcripts up. <laughs> he's gonna get the evidence. I'm gonna. I want to this time because I know it. All right. Next up, Cole Wiggins. He sent us a great DM. Uh, a a DJ at a festival made uh, a remix of the Dune track, the Dune score. Amazing. And he said, "If you don't appreciate this, I'm unsubscribing." I also call this a Dune EDM, Dune DM, Dune DM. <laughs> 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 All right, got it. Hold on, I'm pulling it up right now. So on YouTube, because you can pull up transcripts on YouTube. I don't know if really? You yeah. Do, 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 do. So if you go into YouTube Studio, it'll be about halfway in that episode. YouTube Studio. You can pull up the transcript. Oh, oh, as a creator? Gotcha. Wait, you're supposed to be able to do this not as a creator. That's what I meant to do. Well, it's too it's too bad. No, I can no, just no. pull up on my phone. Hold on, let me find the Beatles section. Ready? Hold on, I'm going to find it. Give me one you second. Gonna, you going to play it live? Gonna, yeah, I'll play it live, and we can all figure this out together. How okay. early do we talk about it in this episode? Halfway. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Here we go. All right, let's hear it. Okay, I'm playing it. Nope, that's Birdman. That's Birdman. Let's get to Beetle. It'll be right here. Yeah. It comes it back. Here we go. Here we go. I got the juice. No, 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 no. no. Fit, stop. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. I got the juice. Keep it going. Let the juice loose. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Let the juicy. No, it says let the 
Let the juice loose. Let the juice loose. <laughs> it's still <laughs> wrong. It's yeah, wrong. Yeah, I, was, I was close. You were not. Yeah, 100% something about juice. Uh, mixed reaction. I said the right words. You did not say the right words. I said let the juice loose, and the, and the thing is the juice is loose. You said the word let is not in the phrase. I don't know. So I said the right words. I just added let. That's what I'm trying to say. No, you let said, the juice loose. Hold on, Jim. Let the juice loose is not the same as the juice is loose. I said it's pretty close. You s not close enough. The two main words, the say I said this, the two main words, juice and loose, I said them. I just gotta say the article and the verb is way off though. What I'm saying is I was close. But you're not were you right? Were you were you right? That's pretty much right. No, oh no. Oh no. I was pretty much there. John, we got him, John. <laughs> <laughs> Evidence. <laughs> Read it and weep. <laughs> Oh my god, so sad. We got, we got him, boys. We <laughs> nice got him. try, Jim. Nice try. John, you got him. <laughs> can't, can't, you can't uh, escape the tape, bro. Pa pack it in. We got him, can't boys. Can't escape the tape. I like that. We got you, man. All right, whatever. I was not completely right. <laughs> Fact check, false. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we have a great five-star written review. From Surf to Die For. Ooh, nice. nice it's been name. hiding. Five stars. From me, perhaps because as a voracious listener, voracious listener of particularly film-related podcasts since their inception, I'm surprised I haven't come across it earlier. All good, since I now have loads already posted and probably Patreon as well. My expectations have been, have to be low due to the volume I consume, but they meet these and more. Don't use filler words constantly like, like, I'll, I'll, I'll like, etc. Al. James is still working on reading, though. I'm learning how to read. <laughs> I love blank check, but it's a glaring issue with all three, and usually the guest also. I only tune into F This Movie for three of their collaborators, as it's brutal. <laughs> how the vast majority of podcasters don't even attempt to improve in this regard is beyond me, given their years of microphones, on microphones for the most. When discussing acting, they use the actor's real-life names, and when discussing within the movies, the characters. Very refreshing because it helps the audience stay in the mood of the films, rather than saying, calling Furiosa Charlie's Theron almost every time, in Max, Tom Hardy, when doing a podcast for every four minutes of a film time, you are awaited. That would, that would drive me nuts, too. They are just calling out other podcasts. I love it. They clearly love the subject matter, research them, which even though I'm already aware, movies moves things along competently. I usually skip... Only two days in the intermission, but it's also a neat idea, which I'm sure many enjoy. I think they're twins. Their rapport is consistent within this. <laughs> it makes for a great experience knowing they truly dig each other. I wouldn't say we dig each other. That's going a little far. <laughs> Especially after this episode. <laughs> Just kidding. I love them. <laughs> well, the outbursts of laughter, the very juvenile hard exchange was pretty brutal. <laughs> <laughs> aren't ideal for ones who tries to fall asleep listening to podcasts and audiobooks. Sorry. Yeah, we're way too loud for that. It still seems genuine in <laughs> the very pickiest of nits. Definitely recommend and can see it being a regular thing. Cheers. Uh-oh. As I was writing, they went into an intermission during heat and asked which year De Palma's Dracula was made, meaning the 1992 Coppola directed Bram Stoker's Dracula. I usually, don't do, I usually wouldn't do the bit, but unsubscribe. <laughs> Wow, a live intermission as well. I love it. Right so they were review. listening while they were listening. Writing while they, they were listening. They answered an intermission question in the review. Surf to die for. Really Surf love that. That was great. That I was love great. how you you listen to a, lot, a ton of movie podcasts. And you bash them yes. all. <laughs> also, and bashed us. Also, we worked really hard to stop saying like and um a lot. And uh. I mean, that was an old problem. I think you need to work on that. <laughs> Still. <laughs> Not the likes anymore. Not the likes. No. Those were... Pretty significantly used. Like, Quite a bit. Like Quite was used a, a lot. Bit. It was like used like all the time. All right, I'm getting annoyed yeah, actually, by you're it gonna, right now. Yeah, actually, you got to get away from it. I'm getting annoyed right It'll now. It'll get stuck in me. But thank you so much for that five-star written review on Apple Podcasts. We're so glad you found the show. That was a wonderful review. It was. Yeah, I liked it. It's it it very entertaining. What's your recommendation tonight? My recommendation is going to be 127 hours. I watched it recently for the second time. The first time I saw it was in theaters. It's so good. Danny Boyle just brings so much energy to his filmmaking. And there's something about humanity that Danny Boyle is really, is really effectively able to capture in pretty much all of his movies. He really knows how to examine people. And I think he does a great job of just putting a microscope on us. You know, that movie opens really interestingly with a great montage of these spliced images of masses of people oh yeah, yeah whether yeah. it's like a, a a religious group praying together or a stadium full of people and it's all it's interesting because it's all smartphone formats so it's vertical vertical mm -hmm. vertical while splicing in the opening scene or the opening morning routine of the main character yeah played by 
um, James Franco in the film, but he just brings so much energy and so much of an understanding of humanity in all of his films, even if it's just a character study, character piece on one person. But uh, it's just really interesting. He, I think he just knows people so well. Yeah. Then I mean, that's a great film for being a guy stuck in one spot. And I will say it was a tough watch for my second view because I knew what was going to happen in terms of like, I knew the first time I saw the film that he was going to lose his arm. Yeah. You, you read, you heard the story and the first time watching it, I was fine. But as I'm watching the first act of the film, it takes a little while to get there. Yeah. I was just waiting for it. And I'm, I was sort of getting a cringe feeling in my stomach, waiting for it, like butterflies or just getting a queasy feeling because, oh, my God, do I really want to keep watching this movie? Do I want to keep watching it? But I did because it's really well made. And that moment's pretty crazy. It's, it's a dull, very dull knife, right? Yeah, because he can't reach his Swiss Army yeah. knife because he's setting up his morning routine. He's getting, like, water bottles full. He's getting his snacks, fruits, because he's going on the secret... Well, not a secret, but he's going on a bike ride very far away. Yeah. And he's gathering all his supplies in the morning, and he goes in his cabinet a few times, and it's a great shot inside the cabinet of his hand, reaching for things, and he's just an inch away from his Swiss oh Army God. knife. Because oh you know that God. he probably got home eventually once after he got out of surgery and everything or out of the hospital yeah. and then he looked in the cabinet he's like the swiss army knife was right there the whole time what was that knife that he ended up using it was a very dull blade yeah it's a little dull blade it's uh -huh. this like tiny little thing that yeah it was not sharp because he has to really just stab it in yeah he has to like break the bone he has to break, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's messed up yeah he has to like tear more than cut essentially yeah. it's a it's a tough watch it, yeah because the the whole all the suspension of that film is a, to the point where he knows he has to he's gonna have to do this it's a matter of can he do anything else to get out of there, and that's his last option. And I think the worst, the the, the toughest part for me to watch was, um, he he bites off the the nerve, the nerve ending in his mm -hmm. arm. That's the the one that gets me the most because that's obviously the most painful part of the experience is that long nerve, Ugh. and he has to bite that off. Oh my Oof, god! Dude. I just got goosebumps in my back. Oh man, Franco's great in that. Yeah, it's pretty pretty bad, man. It's you're on a you're on a boil marathon. Yeah, I love, might as well do some dog. I mean, I was thinking about that. Some dog's excellent too. Some dogs. I was just I was just scrolling. I think it was, it was on Max, and I was just like, "What should I watch?" And I was there. Nice pick, man. Yeah, nice pick. Oh, oh I'm getting cringy thinking about it. My recommendation is Casablanca, also on Max. Great film. Of all the gin joints in all the places of the world, she walks into mine. Here's to looking at you, kid. <laughs> what? Cheers? Here's to looking at you. Oh, here's. <laughs> He's not holding a glass when he says that. I like to hold a glass. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? It's when he's sending her off on the on the runway. I know, I'm just holding a martini glass to you. <laughs> he owns a bar. He does own a bar. Did you know that? <laughs> it's also in Casablanca. Yeah, I know. Anyways, right, let's get back into our episode. Would you like to kick us off with the next film, Anthony? We have another slasher film from Italy, from Dario Argento, Tenebre, which is a really fantastic film. Visiting Rome on a promotional tour for his new novel, writer Peter Neal is pulled into a murder mystery as someone familiar with his work begins a series of killings. While the police look into the crimes, Neal investigates on his own, aided by his beautiful assistant, and you'll see there's a commonality with a lot of our Dario Argento films. <laughs> and a tenacious young local named Gianni. As the, as the murder brutally dispatches of other victims, Neil gets closer to discovering the psychopath's identity. Tenebrae is really fun. It's different enough from um, Deep Red, where it feels like very much its own thing. It's got a different style to it. Uh, great music. Incredible score. Um, super fun kills. Um, I, I love the uh, the Jalo horror films, and it's it's a great genre of this very specific subset of Italian horror films, which actually ties to uh, the detective novels are big in Italy. They've been huge for a while, and they're all yellow books, and they're all called. So this is where the Jalo name comes from as well for the Jalo horror film. Gotcha. But Tenebrae is awesome. Let's talk about an Ingmar Bergman film. Yes. From 1968, we have Hour of the Wolf, starring the great Max von Saito, who plays an artist living on a remote, remote island with his wife, who's plagued with delusions 
and sort of parano- par- parallel visions and disturbing visions. And also there is a perverted cult that resides on the other side of this island. And it's basically a film about the disappearance of this artist. Yeah, it's, it's really... very surreal. <clears throat> Sorry. No, you, you go ahead. It was uh, Ingmar's only horror film. I, I just watched it a couple months ago for the first time. And I was like, when I was making this list, I was like, I got to throw this on here. It's really surrealist. And it's like, it's also like Ch- um, Tarkovsky in, as well. Um, it's really cool. Terrific performance from Liv Ullman, um, or Ingmar Bergman regular. She's been, she was in so many of his films along with Max von Sydow. Terrific f- uh, filmmaking. Just some disturbing stuff, disturbing imagery, really crazy characters. And there's a lot of creativity to the, to the film that, uh, he was he was just like such a master of filmmaking. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I love it. Hour of the Wolf. Also, if you want to watch this, it's on Criterion Channel. Criterion Channel. Oh yeah, there we go. And since we're on an Ingmar Bergman film, why don't we segue into a David Lynch film? <laughs> Let's do it. Inland Empire. And I would say Eraserhead is not. I mean, almost put it on this list, but it's just I think too widely seen of a David Lynch film, whereas Inland Empire is definitely one of his least seen films. Uh, Laura Dern takes the lead role as Nikki, who's an actress taking the role of a film uh, because her husband is very jealous. Uh, Justin Thoreau also plays a role in the film, and they learn that the characters they play is a remake of an unfinished film where the stars were actually murdered during production. It's a really surrealist film. Lynch used digital cameras in this, and what I like about this movie for his filmmaking is he got he he liked to really like he puts the camera right up in the actors uh, with a wide lens, not like quite fisheye, but he creates visually this really t- weird tone of discomfort for the audience, and you feel that with the screenplay as well because you really don't know what the fuck's going on. It's a really fantastic movie. Highly recommend checking it out. Laura Dern is phenomenal. They've collaborated on a few things together. Uh, this is one of, I think, their third collaboration as actor and director. Uh, but th- it's, it's just like they're made for each other, like Liv Ullman and Ingmar Bergman were. And really unbelie- unbelievable horror film. Super weird. Uh, good luck trying to figure out what it means. Um, but check it out. Moving on next to a film from 1990, directed by Adrian Lin. We have Jacob's Ladder, starring Tim Robbins, Danny Aiello, and Patricia Calmer, as well as Elizabeth Pena. It's about a Vietnam War veteran, and the story follows him before leaving the war and getting back from the war as he experiences hallucinations, flashbacks. You know, the people around him start to morph together, and his images are being distorted and twisting together, and he's basically losing his mind. It's an amazing yeah. to madness. It's an amazing film. I had never seen it and I watched it last year and Tim Tim Robbins blew me away. I'd never seen him in anything like it before. But the film does an amazing job of bouncing between realities because it's not like he has like visions for like a couple minutes. Sometimes they last so long that you're like you you they ease you into this being the reality and then he wakes up. But no or then he then he wakes up again. And it gets to the point where as an audience member, you don't even know what the reality of of what's going on is just like him. And on top of that, it just gets more crazy and insane as the film carries on uh, and more surrealist too. Tim Robbins is really fantastic. It's one of his best performances. And I was like pissed at myself for never having watched it because it's that good. Really good movie, Jacob's Ladder. All right, next up we have a fairly recent film which came out in 2018 from Gareth Evans, the director of The Raid Redemption, Apostle. It's an awesome movie. It's about um, this guy who <coughs> travels to an island where a cult lives to infiltrate the island's community. And he learns that the corruption of the mainland society, so that he c- can claim to reject it, has infested the cult's ranks nonetheless. And he uncovers a secret more evil than he ever could have imagined. So he goes there trying to help with his own motives. Uh, but however, he gets <clears throat> taken and found out for his nefarious background. This movie, it's graphic, it's dark, it's grim, and it's really brutal. But it's really interesting. I've never seen anything quite like it before, and Gareth Evans really impressed me, having come from martial arts movies, breaking out that way. And then um, Dan Stevens is phenomenal. He's such a great, underrated actor. I love him in anything. And he really gives it his all in this film. But this movie is bloody and gory. It's fucked up. 
Um, there's some really cool imagery in this film. Um, great use of fire that I just really loved. And I love the gothic atmospheric tone that Gareth Evans created. It was so stylized compared to what he did with the Raid movies, uh, which were so uh, like stunt work heavy and martial arts heavy. But this one is very different from him. Uh, it's not really that well known. And I think that, I don't know, maybe if it came out this year or last year, it would have blown up. Didn't quite find an audience when it was released. It was, an, I think, it was an, a streaming release only. Ah, were they really doing streaming releases back then in 2018? Maybe, I think so. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't remember ever hearing about it. To be honest, exactly. Yeah, it didn't really make a, a, a splash at all. But it's really good. Yeah, it's really good. Let's move on to another pretty interesting horror film called Unsane, starring Claire Foy, directed by Steven Soderbergh. This also came out in 2018. This one, you saw a decent amount of, you know, in terms of advertising and marketing, but I don't think a lot of people saw it. Now, this movie was shot on an iPhone 7. A couple of scenes were shot with the Panasonic GH5, but the majority of this film, Steven Soderbergh did the camera work himself like he does in a lot of his projects. He filmed on an iPhone 7, and he would put this little moment lens on it as well, on the camera part, in the lens of the iPhone. But crazy that, you know, they made this movie for a million dollars, basically. It did pretty well, $14 million at the box office, shooting on freaking iPhone 7s. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't always matter what camera you're using, but, you know, he's an experimental guy and, and likes to do things his own way. And it's about Claire Foy, who plays this woman who relates, re relocates from Boston to Pennsylvania to escape a man who's been stalking her for the last couple of years, and she unwittingly signs in for a voluntary 24-hour commitment to the Highland Creek <laughs> Behavioral Center. However, that stay gets extended further and further and longer and longer as doctors and nurses be begin to question her sanity. She then believes that one of the sta one of the staffers of the hospital is her stalker. She do whatever it takes to get her out. And it's just a mind F of a movie because you don't know who to believe. And of course, we get unreliable narrators often and at times you believe her, at other times you don't believe her at all. And it's a great movie where you just want to know the conclusion. You just need to know. It's just it's burning inside you, the desire yeah. to find out what's going on. It's a cool movie, and for being set in a hospital for the entirety, uh, he keeps it far from boring, especially with the iPhone photography. It's really cool. Like, like why the hell not? He shot a few films with iPhones still since then. He, fl he shot High Flying Bird with iPhones. It's cool. All right, next up we have a great B-movie classic from 1986 and director Mark Harmon, The Hitcher, which was remade in the early 2000s, but the original with... Uh, Rutger Hauer is the superior film. Uh, this is about a guy who's driving cross country and he picks up a hitchhiker. Hitchhiker claims that he's a serial killer murderer. Um, after a, an attempt at taking his life, Jim escapes from the hitcher. Um, however, after thinking he'll never have to see him again, he witnesses the hitcher killing a family. So he sets out for vengeance to try and stop this madman from killing anyone else. And he takes up uh, a partner in crime in Jennifer Jason Lee who's a, a waitress at a nearby diner. And it's basically kind of like a cat and mouse chase, very much like Duel, Steven Spielberg's film, uh, on the road. It's really fantastic. Rutger Hauer is unbelievable. He's so good in this role. Um, this and Blade Runner were, his, I think, his best performances as an actor. Great film. We have, <clears throat> excuse me, another twin movie here. Twin A. Coming up from David Cronenberg, we have Dead Ringers, Jeremy Irons, plays a dual role of successful or, or twin brothers who both are gynecologists. One's more successful than the other. And so one gynecologist is named Elliot. The other is named Beverly. Now, our Elliot's the more confident and also has affairs with many of his patients. And then when he gets tired and loses interest in the woman, he <laughs> sends them over to, Bev to Beverly, the meeker of the two. <laughs> However, Beverly falls for one of these patients and... She inadvertently deceives him, which sends Beverly into a state of madness. And this is actually a highly fictionalized version of the Marcus's story, and it's based on the novel Twins by Barry Wood and Jack Gaisland. This is um a trip. One of the freakiest movies I've ever seen, and being a twin compounded on that. Um, also, this, the imagery is fantastic. So, uh, Cronenberg uses red a lot in this film. So the, the twins, they wear red um, for medical attire. And like James said, there's the confident, powerful leader of the two, and then there's the meek, um, insecure one. Uh, they need each other because the insecure one 
is the brains essentially, um, whereas the confident one is the hands in surgery. Um, but playing, pretending to be one person um, has its benefits and its cons. And it, it all converges into this absolutely insane like final 20 minutes and it's just unbelievable i couldn't i couldn't believe it and it's really very gory lots of body horror as you would come to expect from a cronenberg movie but what's even crazier is like the twins developed like their own um set of instruments for performing sur surgeries and they use these like very crazy instruments and uh, they get used in unsavory ways a couple of times, and it's really fucked up. But it, what a crazy... It was an ending of a movie where I was just like, jaw on the floor. I was like, what the fuck when that movie ended? It was remade recently for Amazon. Yes. With uh, Rachel Weisz starring as the twins. Yes, correct. I didn't see it. I'm not... I don't know about watching TV show adaptations of movies I love. Yeah, me neither. For the most part, I mean, what's the And point? it's like, I was like, I knew they're like, they're not going to go as hard as Cronenberg went. Yeah, probably not. That's the whole point of the movie. All right, next up, we have another film in Italy set in Venice starring Donald Sutherland. Um, still grieving. Uh, don't Look Now, which is about a couple who are still grieving over the accidental death of their daughter. Uh, they try to move on, but begin catching glimpses and hints of her ghost and they meet a pair of sisters who claim that they can talk to the dead uh, which turns into the story of kind of like a really great ghost slasher story in a way um, it's a really interesting film beautiful uh, great cinematography really good score um, Donald Sutherland is a great lead he's did horror a few times this is one of them Invasion of the Body Snatchers is, an, is another one uh, this is much less known. I uh, couldn't recommend it enough. No, it's a really fabulous movie. Don't look now. Let's move on next to Guillermo del Toro. Again, we have another one. The Devil's Backbone came out in 2001. This is a ghost story set like many of his films, the backdrop of war. We are at the Santa Lucia School, and this 10-year-old boy named Carlos loses his father, then is sheltered then at an orphanage in the shelter has orphans of the Republic militia and politicians. And he starts to eventually run and have run-ins with the violent caretaker and eventually uncovers the secrets of the school, including a youthful ghost that wanders the ground. <laughs> I would say this is very similar sort of to the black phone in a lot of ways. Yeah. And it's really creepy. It's disturbing. But in, at times, a coming-of-age film. And I like and it's excellent. It's like Pan's Labyrinth where he uses the backdrop of a really big event um, as the, the, the background of his story. And this time being a really great ghost story. Mm -hmm. All right, next up we have The House of the Devil. Continuing the year of Ty West. <laughs> the year of Ty West, which came never, on <laughs> never ends. 2009. Which I followed... wish he knew about this joke, man. I know, I really maybe do. he does. I hope someone could someone just send this to him. If anyone all... knows anyone that knows that Ty West that knows Ty West, send him our joke. <laughs> and this is a really great uh, horror film shot in 16 millimeter. Looks so vintage. I remember seeing this and I was like, man, this is like so cool. It feels, it feels like a time machine. Um, it it stars um, uh, Jocelyn Donahue as a babysitter who takes on a gig of babysitting for this very old couple uh, in their home, their elderly mother. Um, something's very off. It's just bad vibes. Very strange home, very strange people. Um, it's just off. She, does, she doesn't even have to see this old woman she's supposed to be watching, but um, she's like, okay, I need the money. I'll do this sketchy gig. Uh, however, throughout the course of the night, she comes to learn that this house and her hiring is not what she assumed it was. And the House of the Devil is a good name for the movie because stuff like that really happens. It happens in this movie. Y'all, I don't want to spoil it. I don't want to spoil anything. I mean, the title is yeah. the title yes. for a reason. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it's got something I to do with the devil. I love this movie so much. Really great movie. Really great filmmaking from Ty West where he just went retro. He went 70s with it. 60s, 70s. Crash zooms, yeah. really long pans, awesome music. Greta Gerwig has an early role in this too. And <laughs> the filmmaking, just it just I, I fell in love with this filmmaking because it's so camp. And the same thing with X. He really knows how to take an era and make it for modern audiences in terms of like with modern filmmaking. And 
newer cameras, obviously, but still tapping into the style of classics. He really does so well. Unfortunately, this movie's not well received by audiences. I think it's fantastic, though. I freaking love this movie. It's man. great. It's so well directed. I love it. It's I love great. House of the Devil. Let's move into an Austrian film called Goodnight Mommy. Another twin film. Who would have thought this is like the third twin I film? I think on that here. people think twins are creepy is why. I mean, twins are kind of creepy. <laughs> I mean, they, I feel like if I wasn't a twin, you would think I they would were creepy. Get a creepy sense from twins. They can, <laughs> they can be creepy. We there can. are creepy twins. There are. This came out in 2014, 2015, and directed by Veronica Franz and Severin Fiala. It's about these twin boys who, you know, they do everything together. They're collecting beetles, they feed stray cats, and they welcome their mother home after reconstructive surgery. However, her face is completely wrapped in bandages, and her demeanor is distant, and the boys, the twins, grow suspicious of her identity, and soon, they don't believe this is their mom. They don't know who this woman is anymore. They're trying to figure out who she is. They can't tell because her face is completely wrapped, and they both, basically, it turns into sort of a war of who she is in the in the house, and it's incredible. It's so dark. It's twisted, and it has a great twist. It's excellent film. I really love Goodnight Mommy. They tried to remake it. Don't watch the remake. Recently with uh, Naomi, Watts. Naomi Watts on Netflix. I didn't watch on it. On Prime. As soon as I saw it. the trailer, I'm yeah. like, no, thank you. No, thank I you. didn't even watch the trailer. I don't need to. All right, next up, we have a John Carpenter film in the mouth of madness. This is a crazy movie starring Sam Neill. And so the setup is there's this like super famous horror novelist. It's like a, a Stephen King-esque writer named Salter King. He's suppo- Sutter Kane. He's supposed to be writing his like magnum opus. However, he's gone missing in some random New Hampshire town. So Sam Neill and uh, his novelist, the novelist editor Linda, played by Julie Carmen, uh, Trent and Linda go to this little New Hampshire town to try and find the author because this is where he was writing. However, they find themselves fallen into some kind of supernatural dream state reality where it's just a waking, living nightmare. It's insane. Sam Neill gives it his all. Like, he went all out for this film, and it's really cool. I've never seen anything like it before. It has some bunch of great twists, a fucking crazy ending, and it's just absolutely bonkers. It's one of John Carpenter's best screenplays and more interesting stories he's ever done. Um, and I would put it probably right after The Thing is his next best horror movie. I would say this is the next one. It's really that good. Speaking of crazy movies, we have fin- Phantom yes. of the Paradise, another Brian De Palma another film. Another one! From 1974. Anthony put together this list, so obviously every other movie is going to be Brian De Palma. <laughs> <laughs> this is a rock comedy, rock horror comedy musical, yes. which is absurd as hell. The production design, the costuming, it's phantasmagoric. It's excellent. <laughs> it it's about a producer who steals music of a songwriter. Gives it to one of his bands and obviously gets caught. It's a play on Phantom of the Opera. Then gets yeah. framed for stealing drugs, yeah. lands him in prison. And this forces the producers, I mean, the, the songwriter to eventually like don this crazy costume of this phantom bird man <laughs> with intent on ruining Swan and saving the singer from a terrible fate. Yes. Um, it's pretty out there. It's far out. It's trippy. It's colorful. And it's a freaking rock music for, for, musical from Brian De Palma. It's so much fun, and it's so crazy, and great gore, and great kills. It also, you know, it's about, like, the idea of selling your soul to the devil for success. And would you be willing to do that? And what are the consequences for that? It's so cool. The, the film takes so many turns that you wouldn't expect. And his, his directing, uh, Brian De Palma's directing, was so ahead of its time, and so groundbreaking, and so phenomenal. Um, he really was one of the most impactful filmmakers of that decade, the 70s and the 80s. And I really hope that listeners here and then more people in the future can look into his older films and lesser known films like Phantom of the Paradise because they are sensational and really some of the best filmmaking of the era. All right, next up, all of you spider arachnophobes. We got a good one for you, starring Jeff Daniels. Arachnophobia, which came out in 1990. I remember seeing this as a kid, and it terrified me. Same. So it's about uh, this family. He's a nature photographer, and then Jeff Daniels is a doctor. Um, it's just this quiet town, quiet suburb, that gets infested with 
killer spiders. Pretty and big, too. They're big. They're like Pretty the size big. of little dogs. They're sort of the size of Chamber of Secrets spiders, I would say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's some big ones. Yeah. Roughly that size. Yeah. And, and Jeff, uh, Dan, Jeff, uh, John Goodman's in this, too. He's fantastic as well. Um, this is a really great, just fun monster movie. Keeps it simple. Uh, great time. Really scary. Anyone who's scared of spiders, you should avoid this film. But if you're cool with it, watch Arachnophobia. If you're afraid of car tires, you probably should not watch Rubber, which came out in 2010. It's about a car tire that comes to life with the power and kinetic, psychokinetic power to make people explode. And it goes on a murderous rampage through the California desert. It's a Fre- English language French film. It's surrealist as hell. And yeah, that's that's the plot. It's about a tire that kills people. It's crazy. It's not like the best movie in the world, but it's so absurd. And it works. Like, it's just like a, the fact that he made it work. A tire that just goes around killing people is insane. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great ending, too. I, I don't want to spoil it, but, you know, there's sort of a, there's a setup for many tires <laughs> going to take over a tinsel town. Like, why not, man? Why not? All right, next up, we have a David Cronenberg film, The Brood. Uh, this is a really cool movie. Uh, when a man's wife is under the care of an eccentric and unconventional psychologist who uses innovative and theatrical techniques to breach the psychological blocks in his patients, their daughter comes back to, from a visit with her mother and is covered with bruises and welts. The father attempts to bar his wife from seeing the daughter again, but faces resistance from this secretive psychologist. Meanwhile, the wife's mother and father are attacked by strangely deformed children, and the man begins to suspect a connection with the psychologist's methods. Uh, Cronenberg played around with these ideas, uh, body horror and uh, psychotropic connection, psychic connection stuff. Uh, this is definitely one of the best ones. This is one of his lesser known movies, is why we put it on the list and not other movies like Videodrome or The Fly or Scanners. Those are too well seen, too widely seen. The Brood is a really fantastic horror film. It's not quite on the level of those other movies, but it's right there too. Um, definitely check out The Brood. It's great. We have two left. We have right now, second to last, The Bay, made by Oscar-winning director Barry Levinson, who's made some really excellent movies. Now, this horror movie, it's basically a mockumentary sort of found footage horror film, and it's about the residents of a seaside Maryland community who become the unfortunate hosts of a mutant waterborne parasite that takes the, takes the control of their minds and bodies. Came out in 2012. This is a really cool movie. It's it's one of my favorite found footage movies. It's got a great poster as well. I'm yeah. sure you um, people recognize the poster. Yeah. It's the X-ray of a skull. And in terms of found footage, I'm never usually a big fan of them, but he pulled it off really well on this. And when I watched this movie, I was like immersed completely. And I was like, this. what if this could happen? Can I shout out another found footage horror movie? Yes. Creep. Creep, yes. Creep is excellent. I think it's too widely seen though. Would you think that? Would you think so? I think a lot of people have seen Creep. You think? Yeah. I never even heard of it until you showed me it last year. And I thought it was really, really good. Um, Actually, yeah, it doesn't have that many watches. Let me see how many watches it has on yeah, Letterboxd. Yeah, let's Box. see how many let's watches see. it has on Letterboxd. Why don't you talk about Creep while I Well, Creep is a, is a terrific found footage. F- I guess it's it's interesting because it's found footage, but it's also no, yeah, not. I did, yeah, I didn't put on the list. 330,000 views on okay. ratings. But it's, it's a horror film, a horror found footage film starring Mark Duplass. And basically, he plays a serial killer who puts out this advertisement on Craigslist for a videographer to help him film a video that he's going to show his son, right? He's yeah, gonna... he wants to film a day in the life of his of It's his sort of life. like that episode of The Office where Michael Scott's trying to make uh, how to yes! do stuff for his future son or his future <laughs> kid. He's like jumps out of a car. He's like, attach the things to anything. And Dwight's like, nope. <laughs> Don't do that. But it's basically that, and it gets very weird and very creepy. And it has a sequel that's also excellent too, but it's a freaking awesome horror movie. It's really short. It's very tight, but it's it's really, really well made and clearly insanely low budget done well. Yeah. Yeah. They did a good job. Creep good is awesome. One. Awesome ending. So as I was as I was saying about the bay before I was interrupted. You, you mean interrupted when you said, go ahead and talk about Creep? Anyways. You said, I please saying, talk about I, I asked. I asked permission if I could. When I and you said yes. When I watched it, because like it's it's kind of like a movie like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, or it's not Aliens, but it's like that crazy. But the found footage aspect of it made me think like, oh my god, this is this possible? 
Like, something like this can be possible, but it's really fucked up, really disturbing, really gross, uh, great gore. Um, the Bay, if you, if you like found footage and you haven't seen this one, this should be on the top of your list, honestly. Honestly. Okay, let's finish up our list with a film that came out in 2010, Splice, starring Adrian Brody and Sarah Pauly. Now, this oh, is I not, forgot this is Adrian yeah. Brody. Yeah, right? This is not the best movie in the world, but it's pretty good. It's a really cool idea. So these scientists are creating hybrids of species, and they're like, what if we make a, a, a clone of like a prototype human being? Um, even though it's forbidden by their bosses and against the law, uh, they conduct the experiment in secret, and they birth a cloned child named Dren. She becomes, she's this humanoid creature with incredible intelligence, physical strength. However, things start going terribly wrong, and she ends up becoming much more sinister and lethal than they had ever imagined. I I like this movie. It was fun. I remember seeing it in theaters and having a good time. It's gory. It's bloody. It's cheesy. Um, cool idea. Great great mo movie monster. I'm a sucker for a good movie monster. It had a great trailer. Good trailer, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Because she's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember the trailer. Yeah, she's, that. yeah. She's <laughs> like that. I forgot Adrian Brody was in this. <laughs> yeah. Interesting uh, stuff. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a good movie. It's not amazing, but I think it's worth putting on this list because nobody has seen it. You've seen it. I've seen it. Okay, two people have seen it. I'm sure some of you have seen it. Listening, I'm sure. But if you haven't seen many of these movies, we can't recommend them enough. Everybody, you got some all timers on here for sort of obscure horror films. Yeah. that not many people have seen. Great horror films you haven't seen. Which one's your favorite on this list? On this list, that's a great question. I might have to go with either Dress to Kill or I would say uh, Repulsion. Good picks? Yeah, those two. What about you? You already know. It's the year of Ty West, the house of the devil. <laughs> the house of the devil. Nice, dude. Nice guy. It's a top 10 favorite horror movie of mine. Oh, nice. It's good to know. It's up there. Yeah. I rewatch it. I watch it every year. <laughs> Sometimes twice. <laughs> <laughs> you got me got him boys you, you, didn't girls. The, you didn't do the nerdy voice I didn't, no I don't want to upset you again I don't get upset when you do it um, I think your heart rate got jacked bro I got no I got I didn't get upset I got you were no, I got, visibly irate I got pissed I got pissed because you were offended when I did a voice of you for the even though it's the first time I ever did it no <laughs> well it's because you make me sound like a doofus <laughs> you don't make me sound like a doofus no like a like a nerd <laughs> <laughs> made me sound like an ape yeah it's just a joke man I know my name's James <laughs> <laughs> if you go with, if you go high and nerdy with my voice I have to it's go it's obviously doofy for point of duty <laughs> sir I told you not to disturb me when I'm cleaning my rib <laughs> I put my pants Gail Swallows <laughs> it's nice <laughs> all right <laughs> Boom, my pants. That wraps this episode of Raiders of Lost Podcast. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Anthony pooped his pants. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Again, check out these horror films, our list of best horror films you've never seen before. If you have seen them, then kudos to you. You have great taste, and you're exquisite with your film knowledge, and you're a great film boy or film girl. However, if you haven't seen these, if you want to become an even stronger film boy or an even stronger film girl, then watch these movies. Can't recommend it enough. Take care, everybody. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our chosen one patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Darian, Tyler McFly, Mark Nikaj. Our chosen one patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well, notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel. Raiders of the Lost Podcast is a mirror image production. Sound mixing done by Jacob Kosler. Opening music by Chase Jackson.